evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Committee on Faculty, Staff, and Administration meeting. Um, our first um, item is a call for a vote on item 1A, the minutes of June 7, 2010. May I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. Um, we'll now move the, to the policy calendar. Um, President Tony Perez, will you come to introduce item B1, amendments to the governance plan of the Borough of Manhattan Community College? And I'll have Bob, who's our legal counsel, make the presentation, Bob. Now, you're the one that didn't want to sit outside. <laughs> Good evening. We have a, <coughs> a proposal before you that would amend our, our governance plan with making uh, two <coughs> relatively minor changes. Uh, as you may know, our, our governance plan is a, has a bicameral body. Um, we have the College Council and an Academic Senate. This part of the amendments both would only affect that part of the plan that involves our Academic Senate. Our Academic Senate is proposing to add an administrative committee called the Regulation Compliance Committee. The purpose of this committee would be to um, review as to the academic senate's various committees undertake policy initiatives, uh, but to guide them where there are questions of whether that policy might present some problems with compliance with state or federal law or with board of trustees bylaws or the collective bargaining agreement, to give it a, a second look before it came on the floor, before we, we would be advising them, and then of course it would ultimately come here. The second uh, proposal, and we uh, support that recommendation, uh, the second proposal would create a new standing committee, an academic freedom committee, and that committee would um, uh, advise uh, the faculty and educate the faculty on issues of academic freedom and issues of, uh, and concerns in that area. They would also receive any type of complaints people may have concerning potential academic freedom violations invo involving the faculty and review that and advise the academic senate. Originally, <clears throat> we had not supported this uh, because it was a very broadly worded uh, uh, policy. And um, we then, in consultation with the leadership of the Academic Senate, resolved our concern. <coughs> our concern was that uh, academic freedom can mean just about anything to anyone, and it's often confused with uh, free speech. And uh, we just wanted to be sure that they understood what we were talking about when we talked about issues of academic freedom. So what they did is they incorporated by reference the. Uh, uh, statement of uh, the universe, American Association of University Professors, their definition of academic freedom, and we felt that gave substantial guidance to all parties involved. And so we support their uh, initiative and we uh, support the recommendation that they've advanced. It's always nice to bring recommendations that we see eye to eye on. This one we were fine. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. May I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Chair. Second. It's been moved to second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Oh, sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Have a question here. I apologize. The question for information. I don't don't see in, at, after the committee has been constituted what it then does. It reviews, but where does it make recommendations, and if so, to whom? Okay. It doesn't say that. Well, the, uh, both committees make recommendations uh, to the Academic Senate. The Regulation Compliance Committee is to review the recommendations of the various standing committees of that body and then advise the Academic uh, <coughs> Senate. Uh, the Academic Standing uh, Committee within the Academic Senate does the same thing. Their recommendations will go to that body initially. But, but Bob, I think the problem <coughs> is we may be missing a page because yeah. if you go past the proposed amendment to the language additions to the um, governance plan itself. On the first page, it says Resolution on Academic Freedom Standing Committee, and it shows the addition highlighted and underlined of the committee at the top of the page, but there's nowhere on this page that it has the equivalent on the next page when you're dealing with the Regulation Compliance Committee of a paragraph that describes what the committee okay. does. And I'm just wondering whether we're missing some language. I don't I haven't seen your document. I was asked to pre present the plan. He was told. I mean, it just may be as a, a, a photocopying error, but but we seem to be missing something. I had gotten a page. Yeah, 
not something separate. Yeah, there is, there is the, what's, missi what's missing here, because I've been asked to provide the full copies, I didn't know that was there. What's missing there is the definition of the uh, duties of the academic exactly. standing committee. Exactly. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was copied back to back, something was missing. Okay, uh, but I think <coughs> we've all seen it, and so when, when we vote on this, it will be with the mm -hmm. assumption that the, the omission will be corrected and what will go to the board is the full uh, document. Yeah. I'm not sure that that addressed Professor. We can read it to you, Professor. He has it. Uh, oh, you have, yeah, it. I have it here, but okay. I understood it when I read it, and I, I appreciate the fact that Rick has pointed out, sorry, the vice pointed out <laughs> Rick is fine. that it was a, simply a copying error and it would be provided to the full board. Okay. Okay. Now, it has been moved and seconded. Any other questions? Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, President uh, Thomas Morales, College of Staten Island. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. How are you? Uh, we request, uh, very good, thank you. Uh, we request to name one of the fountains on campus. It is listed on our approved naming opportunities at the $100,000 level. We would like it to be in memory of Nancy K. Munson with a line that says, the Brooklyn Home for Aged Men. This organization has uh, not only endowed in 2008 a $100,000 scholarship specifically to support nursing students, but over the years it has, um, uh, it represents the largest single endowment of uh, $500,000 within the CSI Foundation. The nursing faculty been very supportive of this opportunity to name uh, one of our fountains after uh, Nancy K. Munson, um, and it really will uh, help us in um, uh, our continued uh, cultivation of this organization for further gifts. Thank you very much. May I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Question? There being none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? The motion carries. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Now we move to the Chancellor University report. Um, Kenneth Norris. Uh, there are two faculty appointments with immediate tenure at Hunter College that require the committee's approval. They are as follows. Appointment of David Himmelstein as professor with tenure in the School of Public Health, effective August 25th. 2010 with waiver of the one-year service requirement in section 62d2 of the bylaws also appointment of Karen Kolner as associate professor with tenure in the School of Education effective August 25th 2010 with waiver of section 62c of the bylaws these personnel actions were voted on by the college's PMB committees and are recommended by the president <coughs> Both the Office of Academic Affairs and Human Resource Management have re reviewed and approved them. Madam Chair, I present these items for the committee's consideration. Thank you. May I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? The motion carries. Thank you. There is one item, number 2A, an appointment of a faculty member at Hunter College with tenure in the normal course, which appears on the agenda for information purposes only and does not require a report or a vote by the committee. <coughs> and now we would turn to Vice Chancellor Waters for her report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as is my normal custom, I am bringing before you a HEO appointment with bylaw waiver of a assistant to higher education officer in the central office. Uh, there are also three items of appointments to the ECP below the level of vice president. Three are acting assistant VPs, two at Baruch and one at Staten Island. I also wanted to take this opportunity to give you an update on the early retirement incentive that is currently underway at the university. 
If you remember correctly, the um, 2010 CUNY Early Retirement Incentive Program was approved by the board in June and was amended later in July. It's in the process of being implemented. The ERI is composed of two parts, parts A and B. Part A of the ERI is for instructional and classified staff, the employees who are age 50 and above who have at least 10 years of service and who participate in the defined benefits programs, TRS, ERS, VERS, or in TIAA CREF. The open period for classified staff under Part A opened on August 31st and will close on November 24th. The open period for the instructional staff begins on December 29th and closes on January 27th. And by open period, I mean it's, that's the period in which someone actually can retire. So someone can actually indicate their intention to retire before those dates. Part B of the ERI was for employees in defined benefit plans who were at least age 55 and had at least 25 years of creditable, creditable service. Enrollment under Part B closed on September 27, 2010. In total, as of today, 217 employees have either indicated their intention to retire or have already left the university. Of that number, 32 left under Part B, 25 classified staff employees and seven non-teaching instructional employees. So far, 185 employees have indicated their intention to retire under Part A, 150 classified employees and 35 instructional staff. And of the 35 instructional staff, 20 are faculty and 15 are non-teaching instructional staff. Because the open period for Part A for instructional staff actually begins December 29th, we anticipate that there are many um, faculty and perhaps even non-teaching instructional staff who are waiting to make the decision at the end of the semester. So we expect these um, numbers to go up as the um, period goes, goes forward and we will know most clearly by the middle of January exactly how many people have taken the ERI. That's my report. Um, uh, do we know out of, out of the people who have chosen to participate in the plan, what percent is that of the uh, eligible pool who could participate? Like, like I'm, I'm trying to get a feel as to whether the information that you've given us is good news or bad news, and I don't know. Um, I don't know right now because we haven't calculated that since we are still every day new applications are coming in, so it's still a very dynamic process. I can tell you that in 2002 when we did this, uh, we had about half of the number of people, of people opting to uh, take the incentive, so already we're double what we were in 2002. My estimate right now is that we will probably hit about 500 at the end of the day. But we, again, it's, it's a daily exercise where new applications keep coming in. Remember also that individuals can actually withdraw their intent to retire up until the last day. So there's always an uncertainty about exactly where the numbers will land. But you know, so far it, it looks promising. And, uh, is the are are you of the feeling that the package that we're offering is a good package and is it perceived as such the one i think it is a good package it is it is almost well it is the exact same package that was offered in 2002 however the one uh, complaint I've heard about it from those people who might consider taking the ERI is that if you are not age 62, you, you are not eligible for health insurance. So for many people who are between 55 and 62 who might have the years of service in, they are hesitant to take it unless they have other means of getting mm. coverage for health insurance. Mm -hmm. And is that a, uh, a valid concern from your standpoint? Like or is it a matter of uh, individuals need more education on, on ways that they could avail themselves of uh, dealing with their health needs? Um, as an individual, I think it is a valid concern. If the spouse has, if your spouse has um, health insurance and you can be covered under your spouse's plan, then that certainly is an option for you. But absent some other way of getting health insurance, it's very difficult. And, and quite frankly, it's not something that we, the university, could just say, oh yes, we're now going to give health insurance to everyone who is, you know, who is eligible to retire under this. So becomes, that becomes a cost. So um, I think it is a valid concern. I think that there are people who will not take this incentive for that reason. 
Um, on the other hand, we are doing a number of workshops and educational sessions on campuses to educate people about the opportunity that does exist. Um, and from a personal uh, experience, my, uh, there, I know there is a workshop being held, a panel discussion being held at one of the campuses where people are <laughs> at Bronx Community where uh, recent retirees have been asked to come back and t talk about what they are able to do in retirement that perhaps they weren't able to do when they were working. And that, you know, some of this is psychological. I mean, some of it is really, it's very difficult for people to say, I'm ready to retire because retire, you know, makes you sound like you're going to be sitting in a rocking chair. Mm. But so many of our retirees are very active, and I think that that particular workshop is is designed to encourage people to say, look, you know, it doesn't mean that your life has ended. There are lots of other opportunities for you to take advantage of in retirement. Okay. The your your last statement anticipated the other question that I was going to ask, which I think is probably. Uh, mostly answered and that is that are we providing educational sessions for individuals to help yeah. them to understand not only the financial uh, uh, options that could be available but life options right. you know and so my assumption is that within that course that Absolutely. that's part of the educational uh, segment and that it, it, and then and then also that there'll be uh, you know as we go I mean, going into the holidays, you know, is an interesting time, you know, and so I'm just wondering, are we ramping up with any other, uh, I mean, I don't know what participation is like, for example, in those educational sessions, they and if we're, we're being full. proactive in terms of just ensuring that people can get out and mm -hmm. get the information and, you know, and, and hear the good news. I, I think it's good that we have uh, individuals who have opted in or mm -hmm. out. As, as, you may, as it were, to uh, way you, you know, to kind of come back uh, because you know, personal testimony is better. I mean, people are always skeptical, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, when when these type of packages are offered, and so I'm just wondering. Uh, how we have we're we've with had this. a number of sessions. We've been doing them by borough. They mm. have been, you know, at all of the campuses, and at some places there have been a hundred people sitting in the room. Mm -hmm. So there's okay. a lot of interest, at least, in exploring. This is an option, and you know people have to make the decision on their own, based on their own circumstances. Certainly, are there any budget expectations, or um, in terms of a target number that we are looking for? Not really, I mean, with the way the way this played out, if you remember, the governor had thought that he could get two hundred and fifty million. First effort was that Labor agreed to not do their raises. Second effort was the furlough, and the court ruled that on unilaterally. <laughs> the, ne the next effort was an overtime freeze, which we're doing that saves a little bit of money, but not all that much. And this was the other way to make it. Um, the Division of the Budget, in consultation with the governor, then decided that $250 million would be given to the agencies something they didn't intend to do. So we had to contribute $21 million, and that's part of the problem we have this year that brings us up <coughs> basically $100 million. So whatever we do here, we can use to mitigate against that, but we've already paid, so whatever's done here is to our benefit. Okay, so you have a question. There's a statement. Okay. In the case of faculty, The gain in money needs, of course, to be looked at in terms of the loss of teaching power. Just anecdotally, I have some friends who retired in the earlier initiative who still teach for the university. So in these sessions where you're encouraging people to take off their boots, are you also encouraging them to sign up to teach as adjuncts? I think we we certainly leave that open, but there are um, there are income limitations on how much one you know when you come back as a retiree. So that has to be taken into account. But we certainly leave lots of options open. Um, I might have added to that that they can, the, the faculty members can be characterized as 
full-time faculty in a way that adjuncts who are pre-PhD or pre-full-time faculty could not be. And it make, would make a difference in the <coughs> the way in which we characterize the full-time teaching staff or the faculty teaching staff that our students have available to them. It's a really a big difference when you take somebody who's taught for 30 years and they've retired and you're paying them as an adjunct and somebody who's taught for two years as a graduate student. Anyway, it's it's all, yeah. and there's a lot of variables also. If you're over 65, then there's no, there's no cap on the amount of income you can make if you're under 65, so very individual I, decisions. But your, your general point is well taken. I, I just, the, my concern, which I didn't articulate very well, is that the way in which we present the university needs to be thought of. If, you, if, you, if you're losing a hundred or two hundred full-time faculty, you're losing some of the most distinguished people on the faculty, and uh, that that hurts the educational experience of our students. On the other hand, if they don't actually disappear, um, you get a lot out of them for very little <clears throat> if they stick around. Thank you. Point well taken. Does that conclude, Chair? That concludes my report. Any other questions, comments? There being none, um, I have a motion for adjournment. So, so moved. Second. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.